Hello, good morning, and welcome to today's episode of Energy Shots, a production of the CSIS Energy Security and Climate Change Program. I'm Joseph Mikett, the director of the program here at CSIS. Looking forward to a pre-Labor Day conversation, Kevin. Yeah, we, we, the official, unofficial end of summer is coming. Well, given that a lot has happened this August, we're going to touch on a couple concepts today. Uh, we're going to start with some work that you've been doing looking at the labor intensity of the U.S. energy industry, perhaps related to our themes going into this week. Um, we're at a moment that's kind of tricky in labor markets. This morning I was reading a paper about the labor effects of AI mm -hmm. and how AI is actually starting to measurably affect employment prospects for young knowledge workers. Yes. In the energy industry, we've also seen incredible productivity gains over the last few years. What does the data show us? Well, let's start here with this one. Uh, what we've got here is a ratio. You know, I love good ratios. I do. Uh, and the numerator is the Bureau of Labor Statistics jobs in the oil and gas upstream, along with the services uh, that, that go into upstream production. Mm -hmm. uh, the denominator is the primary energy from oil, natural gas, and natural gas liquids. Uh, and that's from the Energy Information Administration. And uh, the series runs from, from 2010. Uh, you can see here sort of the, the start of the shale boom, uh, and especially the liquids intensive part, and runs down uh, here through the, well, actually, we're, we're monthly data in this series, so very, mm -hmm. uh, very up to date uh, through April. And what you can see is we're going from about 12 and a half jobs, 12 and a half upstream jobs per trillion BTU down to just a little over five. Mm. Uh, and so a very, very significant reduction in labor intensity. Here's the thing. Politicians are always talking about energy jobs right. and energy jobs are important. But the point of energy is not to create jobs in energy, it's right. to be able to do things with energy. In the, re in the larger real economy. That's, I mean, that's, that's why we want yeah. energy, and that's uh -huh. why there are energy jobs. That we've created a prolific number of energy jobs because we have had so much energy supply growth. But we're actually reducing now in the oil and gas sector, in the upstream, the total number of jobs, so the, the numerator is shrinking, and the denominator is growing in part because we've cracked the code on the rocks. Right. There's greater techniques uh, or technology uh, gains and techniques to, to exploit the resources to, to greater value. Uh, part of that is, in fact, AI. Uh, part of that is, is that there's more horsepower. There's a lot going on here at once. Uh, but the, the point of it all right. is not that it's a bad thing, but a good thing, because the people who run energy companies, the people who invest in energy companies, want to actually make money. They want to have profits. Right. And so lower factor costs are also a benefit. So what I see here is a story of innovation. Yes. I see one of increasing efficiency. Can you give us just a little bit of thoughts on what the, the sort of the macro uh, implications of this chart might be? I mean, I'm guessing that these are higher paying, more productive jobs in the industry than we might have found 10 years ago. Well, it's uh, the composition of the jobs is tracked actually in the Bureau of Labor Statistics uh, series. You can right. see where they are and, and where they come from. You still need people on rigs. You can't uh -huh. just have robots doing that at this point. Right. Uh, but there's a lot more robotic technology that's going on. There's a lot more sensing and remote sensing that's happening. Uh, resources are being located more efficiently, and people are also working remotely. Mm. Uh, and so uh, the character of the jobs, these are, in fact, yes, very well-paying jobs uh, in the oil patch. Mm. And, and by contrast, one of the things we hear from the green industry is this is not just a, we don't have to restrict the economy to make an energy transition. As we adopt new energy technologies, this is the, you know, the former president thought jobs, 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 not emissions, That's, emissions, he said it emissions. over and over again. Yeah. Yes. And so what, by contrast, do we find in the wind and solar industries in the United States? Interestingly, uh, two things. Uh, one is that they're much more labor intensive, which is consistent with the, the former president's jobs, 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 uh, pursuit of, of clean energy. Right. Uh, but also that in the clean energy sector, uh, folks want to make money there too, mm. and they're looking to reduce labor intensities. So we have a slightly different series here. The, the green uh, is wind energy and the blue is solar energy. Our series runs from 2017 through 2023, uh, and the jobs here are slightly wider net. This is the U.S. Uh, energy Employment Report, okay. uh, the most recent data through 2023. I think we're due for another edition of that soon. If you're out there, we're watching, we're waiting, uh, and, uh, and the denominator is still the same, primary energy as defined by the EIA right. from these resources. Now, interestingly, as we discussed in an earlier episode, the EIA is counting primary energy from renewables differently. So these numbers are bigger than they would have been uh, when we looked at them last. But mm. what you can see is a 20% reduction in wind 
energy generation jobs over right. the time series. That 20% reduction from about 115 or so uh, jobs per trillion BTU down to a little above 90 uh, is, is a pretty significant labor intensity reduction. Mm -hmm. But solar, you can see on the generation side, from about 1,100 down to a little more than 415, uh, and then that's the blue line, you can see a 60% reduction. Mm. Uh, a lot of this, again, through automation. A right. lot of this through th supply chain optimization. Uh, also, again, the U.S. EER casts a very wide net in how it counts jobs. Right. So what does this mean for the national policymakers? I mean, policymakers want jobs, right? Mm -hmm. They want high unemployment. And as we move in between administrations, we get very different preferences about the kind of where they want to see growth. Right now, it's drill, build, be drill. A year ago, it was build, baby, build. And we don't really know what next year is probably is going to hold. So when we look at the comparison between the oil and gas industry, the wind and solar industry, do, is there going to be? Do we should we expect to see strong employment impacts or jobs figure or jobs changes coming from changes in energy policy? Well, the overall level of of growth in each of the subsectors drives the number of jobs. And so you can have falling labor intensities as these companies and these industries have had and still have overall job gains, which is good. Mm. Uh, and in fact, it's, it's optimal if you can do that because now you have BTUs growing and jobs growing. Right. But there are some signs that we're seeing a slowdown in some of these green jobs. Right. And so when we think about Labor Day, how should we be thinking about the energy worker in the United States? Well, the energy worker is vital for the rest of the workers in the United States. Without <laughs> energy workers, there are no other workers. Uh, and so I think it's central to Labor Day. But I believe something else is happening next week. It's, uh, I don't think it's an official federal holiday yet, right. but is it, is it called Climate Working Group Day? Yes. Well, one of the, one of the things we saw in August, and this is a, you know, a bit of a free radical for today's episode, uh, the Department of Energy or earlier this year sponsored five sort of what we'll call them skeptical scientists, credible experts, to be fair, um, to review the case on greenhouse gas emissions, how dangerous are they, how compelling of a public policy problem. The secretary said he wanted to sort of write the public dialogue about greenhouse gas emissions and climate change. They issued a draft report early in August with a 30-day with a comment period. That comes to an end early next week. This, the DOE's sponsored report, I would say, is like roughly 150 pages. Apparently, a group of climate scientists have gotten together and put together a 450-page response uh, demonstrating, uh, I think, a couple things. Uh, one, scientists are, by nature, picky and attention and detailed people. And so... Argumentative be, as well. They, that's part of science. That's there's part no of settled science. Science is evolving, correct? Exactly. Okay. And so it'll be interesting to see kind of what the what the... Insofar as this is a, the broader view of the scientific community uh, of the DOE report, it'll be interesting to see where there's agreement and where there's disagreement. Um, and it'll be interesting to try, then think about, well, what is, what is the policymaker, what is Washington supposed to do with all this information? You know, I started my career in climate science, so yes. I, I easily fall into the full employment trap of the climate debate. And I wanted to <laughs> just share a couple of things with, with the audience today. One. It's important to bear in mind that there is data that we have available to us. What are we looking at here? We are looking at here uh, a composite temperature index, mixing land and, and ocean surface temperature data, going back into the middle of the 19th century, basically the start of the Industrial Revolution. And we're seeing here degrees centigrade global temperature and um, what is now a familiar curve, right? The upward march of global temperatures. Of course, as we know, climate always varies. So you get dips and you get uh, peaks. But over the entire course of this period, um, you see a, a very substantial increase in global average temperature. Yes. And if you were to draw this out and look at millennial scale changes, you would find that this has been a faster change than we have otherwise observed in our past, in recent Earth history. Now, at coherently, you had an industrial revolution. Yes. You had the rise of uh, the use first of, of wood burning, then coal, oil, natural gas, greenhouse gas emissions, uh, particularly CO2 getting into the atmosphere. And so much of the scientific task over the last 30 to 40 years has been trying to understand the connection between the loading of the atmosphere with greenhouse gases, this increase in atmospheric temperature, and then all of the ways that this expresses itself onto the human condition, both today and in the future. And that's a, that is how we ask the question, what we, should we be doing about greenhouse gas emissions? So you've encapsulated essentially the policy problem by showing the temperature change, which is 
uh, for those of us who are outside of the climate science community. That's right. Uh, this is the part we experience. Yes, this is now. No, nobody, of course, uh, experiences global average temperature. Uh, there's no global <laughs> average person. No, there is not. Oh. Uh, but but we expect this to express itself in regional weather patterns and changes. Some of those have gotten uh, worse, I think mm -hmm. it's fair to say. Certainly in particular places, there have been victims of the changes imposed by, by global average climate change. And um, a big part of, I think, what this debate is about uh, is how compelling are these changes? Okay. And what should they compel us to do, right? Oh. Because science, and this is where I, you know, science doesn't really tell us what we should do about that's, public that's policy, the policy part. and social problems. That's the policy part. And this is where hmm. um, I think over the coming months I wanted to spend a little more time with some of these scientific issues, do my own part to try and help clarify the debate, and push the, pro push the conversation forward. And I think there's two messages okay. from the DOE report that the casual observer should pay a little bit of attention to. Okay. Uh, the first is that these are very long-term trends. And work as hard as we may to reduce greenhouse gas emissions, we're going to continue, we should fully expect to con see continuing changes in global temperature. And those will redoubt to impacts on society. And work as hard as we may to get to net zero in 2050, 2070, 2100, or maybe never, we're going to have to deal with the effects of climate change along the way. So we've got a long breaking distance and a very, very sort of yes. momentum-filled trend. Absolutely. And that tells us two things. One. The climate benefits lag your effort on reducing greenhouse gas emissions. Okay. That's, in, that's a statement that is made in the report uh, sponsored by the DOE. And I think it's something that policymakers need to really take seriously when they think about sure. the feedback cycles of imposing public policy. And the second piece to look at, and this is the one that you and I have talked about before, is that the United States uh, plays a smaller role in global greenhouse gas emissions going forward than it has played historically. What have, what have we got here, Joseph? So we're here, we're looking at total greenhouse gas emissions. This is in 2023. Um, and we've got uh, uh, <laughs> the cylindrical uh, projection of the Earth on the total greenhouse it's gas like emissions. like the Mercator projection, but just different. Yeah, onto a cylinder. Shaped like a beer can yeah. for the weekend, then, Labor Day weekend. And then a depiction of, you know, where are the emissions coming from? We know, and the DOE report even doesn't really dispute that greenhouse gas emissions are forcing warming changes and altering the global climate. Um, we also know where these emissions are coming from. And while the U.S. is a very strong historical uh, emitter, we are now at roughly about 10 percent of global emissions, and our share in global emissions is declining, both because emissions are growing elsewhere mm -hmm. and because U.S. emissions over the past uh, decade and a half have been going down. They may be stabilizing now. Um, if you want to deal with this climate problem, if you want to interrupt the warming that we've just seen, emissions globally have to go to zero. And what that means is we need to be thinking about policy solutions that will effectively address emissions, not just in the United States, but China, India, and the rest of large economies around the world. We have to deal with the growth problems where energy access provides for economic growth, sure. just as we were talking about at the it's beginning, important. Yeah. comes alongside with greenhouse gas emissions. So this is the connection between the two. Yes, and this is this is where the policy and science interact in a very interesting way. Well, can yeah. I can I put a little bit of a, a, a wrench into that otherwise very smooth and cohesive delivery? Please do. Uh, you brought up the point of the the short run political response to a long term climate dynamic. Mm -hmm. uh, I think if I think back to 2020, it was five years ago. And it seems like it, they've been dog years, really. Yeah. It seems like it's been 30, but uh, we. We stayed at home. We wore our bunny slippers and, and our sweatpants. We didn't drive as much. We didn't fly as much. And we didn't emit as much. Yep. Uh, and uh, as a result, global emissions, CO2 emissions from greenhouse gases that year were down 5% or so year on year. Yes. Uh, with a dramatic change in industrialized society's way of life. Right. Uh, and I think energy emissions overall have been down about 4% uh, because not everything was fossil-based, fossil of course. Mm -hmm. uh, and we hated it. And asking people to live like that is asking to get voted out of office. Exactly. Uh, and particularly when you bring up the second point, if the policies that we're enacting here have less effect as the U.S. represents a smaller share of global emissions and other countries somewhere else, China in this chart in particular, and also the cylindrical world, right. which we can't ignore, which wants energy to grow economically. 
yes. then you have a, a, a toxic political brew, <laughs> it sounds like, that's going to be very difficult for policy formation. Yes, it is. And, it, and, and it's something that we have uh, known about for some time. These dynamics haven't really fundamentally changed from when we started trying to deal with climate problems in the late 1980s and early 1990s. The vision at that time was you can get the whole world to cooperate to reduce emissions, right? You can kind of treat it as a collective action problem. Right. Then we can all realize net benefits by cooperation. And how did that work out? Uh, well, we you know we made progress. I think the Paris Agreement is an important uh, you know global uh, ambition setting exercise. But in terms of actual emissions reductions, we've got a long way to go. Okay. And in a world that is getting increasingly fractured, I think there's very interesting questions to ask. A bottom up model, about something a, different than top down. Yeah, I mean, what's you know especially in today's political moment, I think one of the things we're going to be talking about a lot is moving from a collaborative model to a coercive model. And how would we use trade policy, border adjustments to try and align economic and political incentives with reducing emissions? That sounds like a great topic for another episode. I think it does. You know, I managed to get toxic brew and beer can cylinders <laughs> in honor of the Labor Day weekend. I certainly hope all of you have restful uh, and responsible uh, weekends out there on, on the Internet. Yes, me too. Kevin, I hope you have a wonderful Labor Day weekend. You too, Joseph. Colleagues, we look forward to joining you. Look forward to seeing you in a couple weeks for the next episode of Energy Shots. I'm Joseph Mike at signing off. Hope you have an energetic day. We'll see you.